centuries, <laughs> or six centuries, and uh, a Richard Montague uh, was, uh, first, the first record I can find of him was in Wells, Maine in about 1646, uh, but eventually, uh, I guess it was his son uh, was uh, in Hadley uh, in the late 17th century, and it is from this son that uh, Joel's line and my line, uh, two sons of this fellow in Hadley, uh, then Joel comes down one line and I come down the other line. But so somehow or other, Joel and I got together talking about that, and then the fact that uh, he is interested in this lusterware that comes from Sunderland, England, and that we live in Sunderland, Massachusetts, uh, he said maybe he'd like to come to Sunderland, Massachusetts with his lusterware sometime and uh, uh, give us the background of uh, the lusterware from Sunderland, England. And so that's uh, why Joel has graciously uh, come out to tell us and show us a little bit tonight. Thank you very much, uh, Russell. And I, you know what? Before I came here tonight, I did something which I've always wanted to do, uh, which is I drove to Montague. <laughs> and I don't know whether those people had, yeah, that, I don't know whether those people have anything to do with us. But anyway, it was a well, I always assumed that uh, <laughs> yes, since since Sunderland was incorporated in 1718, and since Montague was not incorporated until about the 17 mid 1750s. I've always assumed that those Montagues were ones that we ran out of time. Yeah, that was, uh, maybe that was a, I mean, it was close when I, uh, when I got there. Uh, thanks for giving that background. Let me say uh, just a few words about myself. So, they're, they're, you know, I'm not coming here under false pretenses. Uh, I'm a public health officer, uh, and as I was saying to Dr. Lane earlier, I'm, I'm a collector. I collect everything that I can, you know, I've just got all kinds of weird collections and uh, uh, some of them uh, I have uh, shown. My son and I have just done uh, an exhibition of early French public health posters at UMass uh, Worcester uh, and my son has probably got the largest collection of wartime Zippo writers. Yeah, and I have, uh, I have inhalers back through the last 300 years, so I collect stuff. And that's how uh, the Sunderland Pottery uh, collection started, and it had absolutely nothing to do with this Sunderland. I bought a few pieces, got the locket, and I've been collecting probably for the last uh, 15 years. Uh, with that said, let me just, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the geography of the place, let me just, uh, on the map, you may have uh, uh, actually visited uh, Sunderland, but uh, there it is. It's a, uh, a modest town, uh, not very far actually from Edinburgh, which you can see on the, on the top of the map, it's about 125 miles. I, alas, have never been there. Uh, I was in uh, Edinburgh at the at university for a while and meant to go to uh, visit their collection and uh, never very unfortunately uh, did so. Uh, the town is uh, quite remarkable uh, for a couple of things. Number one, during the uh, 19th century, it was uh, the shipbuilding capital of the world. And uh, that uh, all stopped in about the middle of the 20th century when I guess they were no longer competitive. Also, at one uh, point in time, uh, right, I believe, around the turn of the century,
century, they produced the largest number of bottles in the world. So they were the, the, the bottle center, uh, the center of the world. Uh, for those of you who, like myself, knew very little about uh, some of them before uh, uh, I started uh, collecting, a couple of things are of interest uh, in addition to that. The uh, first is that there is in Sunderland uh, a building which is called the Old uh, Washington Hall. And indeed, it turns out that Washington Old Hall, that uh, these, this building is where the ancestors of uh, the first president of the United States uh, uh, came from. So for about 400 years, uh, there were Washingtons in the town of, uh, of uh, Sunderland. Now, uh, given the fact that we're in Sunderland, Lord Sunderland. The present, present Lord is actually Lord Spencer, who is uh, the brother of the late Diana. Uh, now, this is a secondary title, and uh, as Russell knows, this is something that both of us were chasing uh, uh, for this uh, particular lecture, because we thought if indeed there was a Lord Sunderland, well, how nice it would have been if we had a little note to the uh, historical association saying, uh, you know, uh, something of you know, the usual polite sort. Uh, unfortunately, because it's a secondary title, uh, apparently he's not terribly interested in, uh, in, uh, in Sunderland. He's uh, much more interested, I think, in making money. <laughs> but, uh, and anyway, uh, pottery was made in the rare side centuries before it uh, got uh, 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 famous. There were two or three potteries in the 1700s. Around the beginning of the uh, uh, 1800s, uh, a whole series of uh, uh, potteries uh, started, and uh, the place became uh, quite famous. However, the pottery was considered to be very coarse. And the finer pottery, and uh, you've got some good, good examples, stuff like this, for example, was actually made out of finer clay, which was brought in in the ballast of colliers that went out of uh, the city carrying coal, and that they brought the, the, the finer substances back because Sunderland itself did not very, have very high quality uh, clay for uh, pottery. Now, given the amount of uh, uh, pottery from Sunderland that's available, it's quite interesting that there was not a huge workforce involved in producing uh, this pottery. Uh, I've done a little work on this, and it appears, uh, according to the literature that I've reviewed, that uh, at its peak, and that is to say about 1850, the Sutherland pottery industry employed only 390 or 400 uh, skilled workers. Of these, 60 were women, and uh, around 45 were boys. Uh, many of the pottery workers, that's to say about 50% of those working in the pottery industry, actually came from outside of Sunderland, and by that, uh, it's meant that they came from uh, Staffordshire and uh, from Ireland and uh, so on. However, uh, starting at, at about 1850, there were a whole bunch of uh, 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 potters in the area. And you can see that uh, the people at the museum in Sunderland have identified at least 16. So, even though the workforce at any one of them was quite small, uh, there were lots and lots of uh, uh, potteries. Uh, the uh, pottery industry declined towards the uh, end of the last century, very largely because uh, Staffordshire was much better positioned uh, than they were. And uh, 
essentially by the turn of the century, there was almost no pottery uh, being made in Sunderland uh, at, uh, at all. The Luster Tiles, which is the group of uh, Sunderland Warrior that I'm particularly interested in, were made somewhere between uh, 1840 and uh, 1865. There were maybe a, a few after that, but uh, most of the ones which we'll look at a little bit later on were made uh, during that period. <laughs> One or two have the maker's mark on the back, but it's uh, uh, virtually indecipherable. One of the first things that I did when you so kindly brought in your stuff was to look at the bottom immediately to see if I could spot uh, a maker because when you can find the maker on the bottom, that's, that's a very exciting event. And so on. But I've got precious few. I've got a few, and uh, you know, even with a magnifying glass, I find it very, very hard uh, to read who, uh, who made them. Now, the, uh, before we look at a couple of uh, uh, slides of this, the, for those of you who looked at the literature on this, uh, Sunderland pottery covers everything. It covers uh, a brown kitchenware, uh, yellow uh, bowls, plaques, uh, dinnerware, uh, and so on. Uh, the stuff was uh, shipped to Europe. It was actually shipped also to the United States. And it would be wonderful to, to find out when some of this came over, because I suspect if it was already uh, here, that it probably came over in the, you know, in the middle of the last century. Most of the, the, of the stuff that I have, with very few exceptions, I actually got in the United Kingdom, not here. Because it's quite rare here. I mean, there's not a huge demand to start with. But uh, it's given the fragility, and you can see uh, they're thin and not very well fired, that probably, you know, uh, this part of the country is probably littered with uh, you know, broken pieces of, of Sunderland work. Uh, when you look at Sunderland pottery generally, uh, it's good, uh, I think, to keep in mind uh, one uh, statement which is made by a guy called uh, Joplin, because uh, for those of you that you know, really into high-end ceramics, this is not it. He says, Sunderland pottery is a unique reflection of the political, commercial, and social life of the greater part of the 19th century. The pottery itself is typical of the fun functional, unsophisticated products of the day. So in fact, what he's saying is, you know, this, this is not uh, great works of art. Uh, it's interesting, but uh, uh, don't expect too much. I'm going to show you a few uh, pieces uh, none of which are in my own collection, but which uh, had caught my fancy over time, and uh, which uh, might interest you to see. Here's a, 
Here's some uh, yellow transfer printed. So we're very, very uh, typical again. Uh, this is ship building started earlier, and so you can see a, a, a ship. I think it's about to, to be launched. This is a very interesting thing. The, the literature has all kinds of stuff on this. Uh, this is the parson coming around to get his tithes. And uh, they have a child in their arm, and they're saying basically you want a tenth of the child. Uh, you know, making, making fun of the, uh, of the parson because they were so greedy. By law in England at that time, uh, the, the parson was allowed uh, to uh, force the tithes. Here's a couple of very, very uh, pretty pieces, a little bit more sophisticated than some of the others that we've seen. This is called a bachelor's dinner set for uh, some reason, I guess because all the pieces separated, the candlestick and all the rest of it. So a, uh, a man sitting there and having dinner by himself would have all these uh, things together. And of course, that's a soup terrain. These, uh, obviously, at least on this side, were hand-painted as opposed to being uh, transfer uh, uh, printed. Uh, here's a pretty and not very typical piece, but it's, uh, it is uh, something of the winner. And uh, the edges are uh, crenellated, which uh, makes it a little bit unusual. It's quite nice, it's a, it's a bird catching a, a beetle. Most of these things are you know, 1860 or so. Uh, for uh, those of you like myself who quit smoking, here's a kind of interesting uh, thing. This is a tobacco holder. And uh, if you have trouble reading it, uh, the ashes that is left behind will serve to put all in mind that we are all made of dust and return to it we must. Think of this when you are smoking tobacco. <laughs> so, you know, we're not going to be working with tobacco like this. Uh, okay, uh, a couple of notes on the, uh, the making of uh, Sutherland pottery. Uh, most of it was uh, uh, transfer printed, as I uh, suggested earlier on. That, uh, some of it was hand painted. Some of it was both. And when we look at some of the tiles that I have, you see that very often it's a combination of the two. Uh, what happened was they would throw uh, the bowls or they would uh, press the tiles. Uh, they would wait till they were dry. And then they would fire them at about 895 degrees centigrade, bring them out, decorate them, either transfer print them or the thing. Uh, put it back in, and sometimes they fired them uh, for a, uh, a third uh, time. I'm not a, uh, a, a potter myself, so I mean, that's just what the literature says. It's not anything I have any particular personal familiarity with. Uh, now, Sunderland the Wall Plaques, which is the, the group that I'm uh, interested in, uh, cover a huge variety of, uh, of subjects. And I'm going to show you a few here. Uh, they uh, cover uh, nautical uh, stuff. They cover political stuff. They have, as we saw on some of the uh, earlier things, uh, there is a, a lot of uh, tiles and bowls with the bridge on it. We have two examples here. And that iron bridge was very, very a famous one. It was uh, uh, first uh, made. Uh, they have uh, uh, local dignitaries and uh, figures. Uh, Wesley, uh, of the Wesleyan uh, Methodist group, uh, figures very prominently on uh, some of these uh, uh, tiles. Now, uh, Uh, and uh, 
because of from the museum's catalog, we know that this is actually Sunderland pottery. On the other hand, it's quite unlike a lot of the other uh, Sunderland tiles that we'll be looking at. But it shows that they, that uh, they were capable of doing really very, very classy uh, stuff. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, most of the stuff I have uh, doesn't fit into that. Oh, uh, these are much, much more uh, common. And this uh, is not indeed uh, my uh, collection, but the collection of, a, of a, another British uh, collector. And unfortunately, the uh, transparency is very, very bad. But it gives you a little bit of a flavor of what the tiles were all about. Uh, this is a piece of the type that I actually collect uh, with uh, pious models and exhortations of, of one kind or another. If you take a quick look, you'll see there's a, a very large number of ships and vessels. Seafaring town made, made ships. Uh, uh, no surprises uh, are there. This, which you can't see very well, is actually a tile of uh, uh, John Wesley, and it shows his, uh, his uh, head, and it has a religious model attached to it. Very, very helpful to me in terms of identifying stuff and uh, 
making sure that I'm not uh, doing stuff, so many things wrong. But you can see a bit of the of, of the colors and so on. Uh, there's, uh, there's the eye uh, up at the top. That's you know, probably the same thing. Here's the bad dog. Sees me. That's uh, Wesley again. There was a Methodist uh, academy training school in Sunderland in the middle of the last century. Uh, so far as we know, there are no other religious figures on Sunderland Tile other than uh, Wesley and uh, one of his uh, sidekicks who went in there for missionary uh, purposes. Did those have Masonic connections? With the Pardon me? Masonic connections? Yes, lots of Oddfellows, Masons, oh, um, yeah, lots and lots of stuff, Oddfellows, just, yeah, you see all this uh, Masonic stuff, it was very, very uh, uh, popular and important. Uh, here are uh, a few, uh, again, of uh, the religious uh, plaques and tiles, and in this, type of thing which has the uh, greatest uh, interest uh, to me. Uh, now I will uh, go back to my text on this because uh, it's uh, really quite interesting. Uh, there were, uh, besides the plaques, which were the major way of making sort of pious statements, there were lots and lots of monks and plates of this sort, which also had them. But the tiles which were hung on the wall uh, were just like, you know, blessed be our house and all the rest of it. These, uh, you know, provided an appropriate uh, sort of a pious atmosphere for many of the uh, uh, middle class homes in Britain during the uh, Victorian era. Some of the uh, Religious statements are wonderful. I'm going to read you uh, three of them uh, just because they're such fun. And uh, for those of you, and I hope there are none in, in, in the room who are as obsessed about this as I am, I brought a, a, a long list of religious statements uh, and where they come from. And I had a, a British pastor who's tremendously interested in the derivation of these uh, sort of pious exhortations. And some of them come from hymns, some of them come, of course, from the Bible, some of them uh, come from, you know, sort of popular culture, rhymes, and so on. So I've got a couple of pages of that, which I'll give to Dr. Wayne when I'm done. And uh, if you want to put yourself to sleep, that's a good way of uh, <laughs> doing it. But let me read these three, because they're great fun. Uh, this is uh, on a mug. Be wise than Christian, why you may. For, swift, for swiftly time is flying. The thoughtless man who laughs today, tomorrow will be done. <laughs> well, here's another one. This is, this is really good. Uh, do thy best and leave the rest. <laughs> and here's another one too. Uh, the world is a city with many a crooked street, and that's a marketplace where all men meet. If life was merchandise which man alone could buy, the rich would live, the poor alone would die. Which is really, it's a kind of uh, thoughtful. Uh, let me then uh, say a couple of words which uh, we were talking about uh, before uh, uh, you all came this evening, which is an extremely interesting thing. Uh, there are, uh, there's real difficulty in separating uh, some of the Staffordshire pieces. And I brought a couple of pieces of Staffordshire. For those of you who are into uh, ceramics, you may very well uh, correct me on some of this stuff. But here, this, this, these are, you can see, you know, they have the, they have the glint and they're, they're, they're pretty, and you could confuse some of this with uh, a Sunderland wear. And I have a long letter from the British Bureau called William Walker setting me straight on this, which is very 
What do some of these things run for? That's pretty sure. Why did you ask them? How much does some of these things uh, cost? Oh, really? This is a nice piece because it's got two of them, so I have six rotations on it. Are there any ceramic collectors in the, in the world? Because uh, one of the people that I work with is a woman called Elizabeth Bradley. I don't know if uh, any of you collect. And she goes over to England with her husband, who's a retired lawyer. She's doing this sort of late in life, and I think that she likes ceramics. And uh, she has a list of all of my sayings. And so anything that's not on the list, she basically uh, buys and uh, takes 20% off the top. And uh, you know, we're friends, and I'm very happy with that. What's something like this cost? I mean, it depends when I bought it. I mean, when I first started buying these things, they were about uh, 100 bucks a piece. Now, for really good high-end pieces, you can, you, can, you can pay lots and lots of money. Like for this, this is extremely good. Uh, piece. This is probably now worth maybe four hundred five hundred bucks. The British like them. And so if you find one here in, in, in this country, and uh, if you think it probably looks real, then uh, you know it just kind of as a as, as a nice. It's not a lot of volume. Here's a. Yeah, and what, what I try to do, which is 
you know, completely understandable, is I will buy duplicates of the same, but it, one has to be round, one has to be square, one has to be green, one has to be yellow, or whatever. So they don't. Uh, yeah, the coloring on all three is different, but the same is the same.
The Church of England would have no interest in this whatsoever. But it was these general working folk who took a, their week's vacation at Blackpool and who would buy a mug and come home and put it on a mantle with their Staffordshire dogs. That's, that's my story. And you're, you're wondering about um, how it all got over here. I know how it all got over here. After the war, in the 1950s, when England was desperate, they sold virtually everything that was not nailed down. Wow. And it came over here in vast quantities. Oh, what came over here? That's in the 1950s. Yeah. Uh, because a friend of mine, you know, a big English dealer in the United States, had this summer luster in stacks right here in Northampton. Really? Yeah, it's all dispersed now. And at that time it was virtually worthless, but yeah. obviously it's now increased substantially. Yeah. Uh, oh, and the two fingers that you pr produce, um, they did a statue of Dwight L. Moody, the statue people. Yeah. It's the only one of that ilk that I know of. But I thought you can, he was a founder of this. Not for schools up here. Uh -huh. and, uh, let's see. Two minor points. Oh, I, I was going to say that most of this stuff was uh, in the 1850s, kind of made as local souvenirs. It would be comparable to uh, Mount Tom stuff here. Uh, it's a little better than early Mohawk Trail. <laughs> And these English factories, of whom of which are great many, um, produce vast quantities of this uh, lusterware in various colors. But some of them seem to have done just pink. I don't know. Very pink colors. Do they do? They like. They like pink. Well, it was uh, copper, bronze, gold, and silver. The silver probably the scarcest, and that was done. For those people who couldn't afford the real thing, but if you had a silver resist cup and saucer, you were you were approaching gentility. <laughs> uh, um, you spoke about mugs, and uh, most of those mugs, or many of those mugs, they were famous for fried mugs, yeah. so that when you looked inside, it was fried. Yeah. And once you start drinking, when you come to the fry, you better be careful. <laughs> <laughs> so, also, I have seen some of them as big as five gallons, these big jugs. And interestingly enough, those were like cigar store Indians. Mm -hmm. There were trade signs for a uh, shop that sold chamber property. And uh, speaking of chamber crockery, <laughs> there was a uh, certain element of a certain number of workers in England, in uh, some of them at least, who were not preoccupied with God, but enjoyed a few of the more saucy aspects of life. And among the things they produced a fairly large number of chamber pots. They probably had a bridge on the outside, but on the inside, when you looked in, there was the all-seeing eye looking up at you. <laughs> and basically, yeah, you covered it so well. I had a few of those verses too. Um, As a ring is round and hath no end. So is my love unto my friend. <laughs> Isn't that nice? Yeah. In this jug, there is good liquor, fit for either priest or vicar. Oh. <laughs> but to drink and not to spill will try your utmost of your skill. <laughs> or my favorite one is, 
There ain't no justice in this here land. I just got a divorce from my old man, and I laughed and I laughed at the judge's decision because he got the kids and the kids ain't his. <laughs>